Well, good afternoon. I'm sorry I'm late, but only because I understand you have been very much mesmerized by the last speaker. And this is your last day, therefore you probably feel you have had enough of this conference. <laughs> but I'm very much privileged to be with you this afternoon, coming all the way from Bangkok, Thailand. I'm, I'm sure some of you must have heard about Thailand, <laughs> but I'm not quite sure that all of you have heard about the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. ASEAN. I once gave a lecture to a group like this, a younger, younger age, in America. And after I was introduced, a young lady said, are you sure you spell Asian correct? <laughs> but it is ASEAN, the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. It began back in 1967 when many of the members were just coming out of the colonial background. Great Britain certainly was one of the colonial masters. Having ruled Malaysia, Singapore was part of Malaysia, Myanmar, and France ruled Laos, Cambodia, Vietnam. The Dutch ruled Indonesia. The Americans ruled the Philippines. Thailand was one kingdom that stood through the colonial time. Therefore, it was appropriate for Thailand to call a meeting of neighboring countries, former colonies, Let's talk about the future course of our diplomacy in Southeast Asia. And all these things sound history to you. But about 10 years before that, there was a big, big meeting in Indonesia. And it was called the Afro-Asia Conference. Most of the countries from Africa, from Asia, came together in the city of Bandung, in Indonesia, trying to map out the future course of their cooperation. Later on, this movement became the Non-Ally Movement, the Third World, the Group of 77 plus China. Why 77? Because at one point, there were 77 of them but essentially most of the developing countries came together. So 10 years later, 1967, these small countries in Southeast Asia felt that we need something manageable, a stage for ourselves, so that small countries like ours would not lose our identities among the heavyweights of the emerging world or third world at that time. Nasser of Egypt, Nkrumah of Africa, Nigeria, Julius Nyerere of Tanzania, Mr. Tito of Yugoslavia. These are the, the people, the luminaries emerging on world stage at that time. Small countries in Southeast Asia felt we need something of our own and we call ourselves the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. At that time, the Mekong River, if you think of the geography, was the dividing line between free market economies of Southeast Asia and socialist, communist portion of Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia. But later on, all 10 countries of Southeast Asia became members of the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Now, it was Henry Kissinger, you know who he is? Henry Kissinger made this statement in the 70s, last century, sounds a long time ago. 
He said, East Asia as far as economic progress, technological advance, and economic dynamism, trade investment, as far as these things are concerned, they are equivalent to 20th century Europe. But if something were to happen between them and among them, there is no institution, no process, no system to take care of the problems that could emerge out of the conflicts among them and between them. And we have enough problems among them and between them. China and India, two giants, once fought a war, 1.4 billion humanity, 1.2 and a half, 1.3 billion humanity, divided in the middle, divided on the roof of the world Himalaya mountain, with borders, common borders, China and India have had a lot of historical baggage. Japan and China, even now, is having problem, are having problem with each other over small islands and islets in the eastern China Sea. Japan and Korea, Korea and Korea, You got the message. Anything happened, Henry Kissinger said, they don't have institutions, they don't have systems, they don't have processes to take care of themselves like in Western Europe, NATO. And the rather complex alliance between the US and the UK, US and Germany, outside and, out, outside and inside the NATO framework, institutions, and then the European market, the common market. So because of that observation, because of that lack of institutions and process, small countries in ASEAN, beginning with five of us, now 10, have been given that centrality role to bring various players with interests with borders on the Pacific Rim, with borders with Asia, with East Asia, to come together on our stage. We call that role centrality. Now, ever since 1967, we have evolved from just working on economic cooperation, cultural exchange, we are also working on political and economic political and security cooperation, so that we, we have to make sure that we are at peace with each other, so that we can go on doing economic development, so that we can attract foreign direct investment into the region, so that we can increase trade among ourselves, so that we can integrate among ourselves. We have been doing that since the late 60s and since the late, since the 70s. Now, in October 2008, East Asia and Europe have this thing called the Asia-Europe meeting at the highest level, at the summit. In October 2008, when the Lemon Brother issue was, was moving very fast, when Europe was very scared of what's happening, there was this meeting of ASIM in the Great Hall of the People of China, the seat of the Communist Party in Beijing. Mr. Bulos, Mr. Bulosconi was there, Mr. Barroso was there, Ms. Merkel was there, Mr. Blair could not make it, so he sent David Miliband, <laughs> your foreign secretary there. Sitting at the head of the table, surrounded by leaders from East Asia and Europe, was none other than the Prime Minister of China. And one statement coming from all leaders of Europe, from Borosso down to Bolosconi, please East Asia, please China, please keep it going. Please keep importing from us 
please keep consume, please keep buying from us. David Melbourne took me aside, Mr. Secretary General. This is a very strange meeting indeed. I said, why? He said, we from the West, market economies, coming to East Asia, coming to Beijing, coming to the Great Hall of the People, the seat of the Communist Party, we are asking for help. Well, that was the first time that I personally could feel that the pendulum had swung to the East. Since then, Europe, North America have been in trouble. And you've been trying to get out of this trouble, while in the East, they keep on growing. 5.9, 6.5% a year since then. Consuming more, investing more. In fact, Europe is exporting more to us. And foreign direct investment from Europe is the highest source of FDI coming into ASEAN, 10 countries, not China, not Japan, not Korea. Only coming into ASEAN, the highest portion of foreign direct investment, 120 billion US dollars last year, came from Europe, about 20 plus percent. What are we doing in East Asia that we deserve this attention, we deserve this interest from the rest of the world, particularly from Western Europe? Well, as I said, since the late 60s and early 70s, we have been building our own community in East Asia, beginning with ASEAN. Now, the 10 countries of Southeast Asia, with a combined GDP of 2.6 trillion US dollars. Total population is bigger than the EU, 600 million plus. Of course, per capita income is lower. Of course, science and technology is not equal, but they are consuming and they are traveling, and they are sending their students here. They are consuming your services, your health, your tourism, your education. That's why what is going on in East Asia deserves your attention and your interest. Now, the countries of Southeast Asia are now working on our ASEAN economic community. And this community is going to come into being in the year 2015, less than two years from now. What does it mean when, we, when 2015 comes? Well, more products are going to cross borders among us and between us. More services will be accessed to without having to travel. From Bangkok, you can use telecommunication in, from Singapore, tourism flow, education flow. You can have services also being access to cross borders. You can have investment crossing borders. You can have capital mobilization going on in all stock markets in order to, to mobilize resources for investment inside. These are the things that's going on, and more and more foreign companies are coming to Southeast Asia, coming to ASEAN, in Singapore alone, because it is an open market already, because everything is open, everything is convenient in Singapore, and it is in the heart of ASEAN. There are 7,000 European companies already making home, making Singapore their home. And from there, they branch out to invest, to take over, to co-invest merger and acquisitions going on in the entire market of Southeast Asia. We are not going to stop only among ourselves 10. We are now 
working on a scheme to put our own FTAs with six countries important to us, adjacent to us. Which are the six countries? China, Japan, Korea, Australia, New Zealand, and India. Three billion plus consumers of these ASEAN plus six are now pursuing what we call the ASEAN Regional Comprehensive <coughs> Partnership. We bring Australia in because Australia is a vibrant economy in the southwest of the Pacific. And when you bring Australia in, New Zealand usually comes along. In fact, the speaker on the first day, Dr. Supachai Panichapak, Secretary General of Angtad, I was his campaign manager when he ran against a former Prime Minister from New Zealand. Australia supported Dr. Supachai, you are speaker on the first day, former Deputy Prime Minister of Thailand. Australia supported Supachai, New Zealand had its own candidate. That was a very strange campaign around the world because Australia and New Zealand never walked apart. But that time, we got Australia to support us. New Zealand had its own candidate. But it's more interesting. It's the only campaign that India and Pakistan could agree to support Dr. Supachai. <laughs> Usually India and Pakistan couldn't go along, couldn't really get along. But somehow, we could get the support of India and uh, Pakistan. But Pakistan is not part of this architecture that I'm talking about. India is. So we hope that by the year 2015, this structure, this new structure of ASEAN 10 plus the six countries around us connected to us, important to us, will begin to have that new structure called an integrated East Asia. Not quite a big C community, but definitely a more integrated East Asia. Now you can see the dynamism and the energy and the synergy that could come out of this 16 countries, 16 economies, over half of humanity that would work together in order to create our own regional integration. Now, are we going to be a close market, fortress of East Asia, like we used to be afraid that Europe would be a fortress Europe, keeping everybody else out. The regionalism that we are practicing is open regionalism. We create a more integrated East Asia in order to increase our own bargaining with the rest of the world, but certainly not closing down our market and just trade among ourselves. In fact, all 16 economies in East Asia, ASEAN plus six, are very vibrant, vibrant exporting economies, all of us. And not only just among ourselves, but with the rest of the world. But of course, when the rest of the world is in trouble, Europe, North America, we need to also generate our own demand, create our own market in order to be self-reliant, waiting for Europe and America to get back on your knees, and we can trade, we can export, we can import again. And we have been lucky since 2008. 
we had our own crisis back in 1997, 99, if you recall, the Asian financial crisis. At that time, the IMF said, you better put your house in order. Companies that need to fall, let them fall. There's no such thing as too big to fall or too big to fail. You have to keep your interest rate high. You have to keep your budget in surplus. We were given a very, very bitter prescription in the late 90s. When it came to Europe and America, IMF has been much, much more lenient. You are now are being prescribed more stimulus packages. You are now being let off the hook. There are some of the companies, some of the corporations are too big to fail, too big to fall. We did not get that privilege back in the late 90s. And of course, many of you are not being required to keep your budget in the surplus because I think we realize, and the IMF realized, the international financial institutions realize that Europe needs a different kind of medicine from East Asia back in the late 90s. But because of that crisis, and because of that bitter prescription from the IMF, we were able to reform, we were required to reform better governance, and more transparency, and we perform, and we are back on our we were back on our feet. 2003, the crisis was 1997, 1998. By 2003, all of us were performing better than before the crisis. So when the crisis came, global crisis came in October 2008. We were quite ready. We had enough foreign exchange in our reserves. We could dole out stimulus packages to stimulate our own economies, all of us. So when you went to China during that time, or even now, every city, big or small, you know, in the inner part of China, in, in uh, Sichuan, in Yunnan, in Hubei, small cities is about 20 million. When you go to these cities, roadblocks and construction sites, detours, you ask them, what's going on? They said, we are digging our subway. And you ask them, how many of them? Six at the same time because they had enough money. Thailand did the same, Singapore did the same, Malaysia did the same. In fact, we recover or we sustain ourselves through the crisis since 2008, waiting for Europe and America to get back on your feet. And we have been waiting. <laughs> we hope you'll get up to your feet soon. But here is a common impression. Mr. Obama said to our leaders in 2010, on the sideline of the UN General Assembly, September, if we, America, would want to get out of this crisis, we need to export more, we need to sell more. We look around, where are the consumers, where is the market, you in East Asia, you in Southeast Asia. So that's the perception. And that's exactly why major countries, major economies would want to converge on East Asia, including the EU. We know that if there is something happened between us and among us, China and Japan, 
Korea and Korea, Korea and Japan, there will be instability, there will be insecurity. So recently the U.S. said we are pivoting toward East Asia because our commitment in the Middle East is now drawing to a close. We know that the center of gravity is in East Asia. We would like to pivot ourselves to East Asia. We have a security and political forum at the highest level called the East Asia Summit. ASEAN plus six, and last year we admitted the US and Russia at the same time. So Mr. Obama was there just right after his re-election, and the Russian leader was there because at this point, East Asia, our stability, our security, East Asia has become more important to the global community than five years ago, than 10 years ago. Because your export, your investment, your trade, your tourism, your education, your health, your health care, your services, your goods, are the products and the services that are being consumed in East Asia by East Asians. And if anything happened, politically and security-wise, the world will be affected much more than five years ago, than 10 years ago. So you see the headlines. This week in Financial Times, G20 finance ministers did not criticize what Japan is doing. Because what Japan is doing is essentially to weaken the yen so that they could export more, so that they could welcome tourists more. But it has become a rather destabilizing factor in international currency trade. But precisely because East Asia needs to grow, precisely because Japan needs to grow, Precisely because the consumers, the investment are being concentrated in East Asia, the global community has an interest in making sure that East Asia, Japan or China or Korea or ASEAN will keep on growing much like back in, the 2000, in October 2008, when European leaders called on China, called on Japan, called on Southeast Asia, keep it going, keep it humming, keep consuming, keep importing from us. We realize that. And that's exactly my message to all of you. That whatever we are doing there, we are not doing just for ourselves. We realize that the measure of the success of East Asia is not how much we accumulate, not how much we produce, not how much we export, not how much we consume, not how much we accumulate in the form of foreign exchange, but how much we contribute to the stability of the global community, to the efficiency of the financial, global financial institutions. We are taking more interests. We are contributing more, and we are hoping that we will make that cont contribution to the prosperity, common prosperity of the global community. So, you can be very, very attentive to what's going on in East Asia, but please don't feel that, it is, that we are your threat that would make you insecure, that would you know, take all the investment from you, that would become a fortress East Asia, that would not help you to recover, or your 
industries or your factories to return to full capacity again. If all this is not happening, it is not because we don't want to buy. It is because you have to put your house in order first. <laughs> and I know that that is what the European Central Bank is doing, that's what the leaders in Europe is doing, and that's what the financial institutions in the world are doing, trying to help Europe, trying to help America, to get back on your feet so that the road to prosperity into the future will be a common road, a common road for all of us. You are asking me, is Asia, is East Asia going to be like the EU? I can only say that Henry Kissinger still has that prophecy right. And there is so much diversity in East Asia. We draw inspiration from Europe. You are a source, a major source of our inspiration. But you are not our model. We can't. Communist China, free market Japan, absolute monarchy still, very noisy democracies around us. And many of us are centralized even one party system. So we are still very much diverse. But of course converging on many, many issues. But still far apart compared to European community. 27 of you have to measure up to certain standards before coming into the EU. For Southeast Asia, for ASEAN, you only have to be in Southeast Asia. <laughs> and you are already a member of the group. An absolute monarchy is in the group. Two or three communist governments. One largest Muslim country, Indonesia. Three or four Buddhist kingdoms next to each other. Only one Christian Catholic country in East Asia, the Philippines. East Asia is very, very diverse. The fact that we could hold on together is already a miracle. And we will work to integrate ourselves also to benefit the rest of the world. The previous speaker before me said, wait 50 years and wake me up and to see if my prediction comes through. In my case, wait 10 or 15 years. <laughs> East Asia will be your very, very important partner to walk into the future together. By that time, all of you will be working. All of you will be benefiting from our integration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Pitsawan, for that talk. Um, we have about 10 minutes for questions, if we could have some hands. Um, if you want to go to the lady in the blue jumper, just sit back there. Yes, please. <clears throat> Hi, thank you very much for your talk. Um, you said that um, the Asian countries can um, gain inspiration from the Eurozone and the EU. But what kind Not of... Not the Eurozone, from, from the EU. From the EU. <laughs> um, but what kind of inspiration can the EU, who is in crisis right now, gain from ASEAN? Well, one inspiration is we are not in a hurry to have a single currency. <laughs> no, really. Uh, Europe, have, Europe has achieved so much through your own integration. 27 of you are trading with each other, I was told. I thought it was 68 or 70 percent. But I was told by the European uh, head of uh, diplomatic uh, corps 
coming to visit me from, came to visit me from, uh, from Brussels. He said, no, it's 85% of all trade of the 27 member states are trading among yourself and within the community. We in ASEAN is only 25, and that's one of our weak points. NAFTA is 50% among the three countries. The EU is 80, 85%. We are only 25. We have to increase that. And the fact that you could integrate and you could bring down protectionism among yourself or protective measures among yourself, it's an inspiration to us. And prosperity could go across the landscape of 27. We are still way different. The highest among ASEAN, I'm, I'm talking about ASEAN now, not East Asia, the highest per capita income in ASEAN is Singapore. Next is Brunei. About Singapore is about 40,000 US dollars a year. But the poorest among us is still less than $2 a day. This imbalance cannot be sustained. But when you look at Europe, with the integration fund, with the regional support, with all the initiatives that the central mechanism in Brussels could divert resources in order to help with the infrastructure, with the development, with the education, with human resource development in all the regions of Europe, in all the partner countries, something that ASEAN will have to learn. This is one more issue. Science and technology. We, you know, we are, while I'm saying we are growing 5.9, 6.5% every year. When you went into the, diff, the, the minus zone, negative zone, not growing, but with that rate of growth, we are still having a lot of cases of poverty among ourselves. And we are not investing enough. And this is the truth that has to be corrected, and we know it. And that is science, technology, and innovation. We are at risk of being caught in that middle income trap. We are not going to get over $10,000 per head, per year. And that's the dividing line between high income and middle income. A lot of us in the middle income, and we are at risk of being caught there because we began our industrialization with cheap labor, importing technology, abundant resources. We can't compete with the rest of the world. Africa is doing the same thing now. China and India are doing the same thing now. So ASEAN will have to move up the ladder. Science, technology, education, human resource development, innovation. What Europe has achieved, we also are drawing inspiration and we want to do the same. Otherwise, we realize it's going to be very difficult for 600 million people to really be effective and high consumers. Middle class is growing, yes, but it's not enough to be competitive when you don't have your own human resource development. Okay, I know we've got a question down here, right at the very front here. 10 minutes, you said? Uh, yeah, <laughs> five minutes. Sorry, yeah. Hi there, thank you very much. Um, you talked about security developments and how they would affect the rest of the world, what was happening in East Asia. How concerned should we be about the situation in the South, South China, Ch China, sea. China Sea and the developments there? Um, and is that hurting ASEAN a bit with all the tension there? Yes, um, certainly it, it has brought about a, a sense of uncertainty, lack of confidence in the region. And as I said, if anything flares up, it's going to have an impact on potential investors, traders, and business coming in into ASEAN. And that's why the issue is being taken as a serious uh, issue of highest priority on the, on the uh, highest level of uh, agenda that we have. Uh, four countries of ASEAN, Malaysia, Brunei, Philippines and Vietnam have counterclaims over parts of the South China Sea. 
Six of us have no claim. But we are working among ourselves to have a common position to discuss with our Chinese counterparts that let ha let's have what we call the code of conduct among ourselves, for ourselves, that would be binding. And that is, before the line of control and sovereignty and ownership could be drawn, which will take years into the future, let us have a code of conduct between ourselves and among ourselves. How do you behave going into the territories of dispute? And Thailand is in the lead between ASEAN and China, because there are 10 of us and one China. Thailand is in the lead. We call uh, Thailand the country coordinator. And uh, we have one very, very clear signal, and that is a flare-up in the South China Sea is in no one's interest. Let us keep it calm. Let us work and drive toward that code of conduct. And let us avoid any impression of instability and insecurity because it will affect everyone. 80-85% of all the shipping from Northeast Asia to the Middle East to Europe, from Europe through the Horn of Africa into the Indian Ocean will have to go through that body of water. 85% of energy sources for China itself, for Japan, for Korea, all three countries, 80-85% of the energy source will have to come through that body of water. So with that kind of realization, all of us have common interest to keep that body of water calm and secure, including the overflights, infl including freedom of navigation, and that's what we are working toward. And we are disturbed by whatever is happening between China and Japan over this piece of rock and China and Korea. Because any sign of instability will affect confidence, will affect that 120 billion US dollars FDI last year. This year may be higher because money and capital are very, very sensitive to political and security issues and instability. That's what we are working on. And Europe is interested in that because Europe needs to trade with us, because Europe needs to export to the Eastern market. America is interested. Russia is interested. We are all in it together. And we are working quite closely with each other, consulting how to calm this troubled waters. I think that's all the time we've got for Dr. Pitswan today, so can we once again thank him for his time. Thank you.